the shadow side of the rescuer is where a person can get um, really, really, really blocked. And the rescuing can become very dark. And it can be loaded with dark intentions, private intentions. The reason one's rescuing someone is it's not actually, shall we say, positive motives. Hi everybody, time for another video, uh, archetype video, and today I decided to do the rescuer. I think the rescue is an archetype that a lot of people can relate to. I know in my workshops I have I meet people who will often comment, I am such a rescuer, I'm such a rescuer. And oftentimes, many of those same people We'll say, I'm telling you, I'm burned out from this rescuing pattern. So I'm going to address that in a minute. But the first thing I want to say is that, you know, thank God for the rescuer. Think of how dependent we are on rescuers. So from a, from the magnificent point of view, the, the rescuers include, you know, our firemen and our policemen and our people that, that, they send out when there's avalanches and all these people disappear on the side of a mountain and and I mean when boats overturn and and they have to send out people to to quote rescue <coughs> you know all the people that are drowning I mean we this this is this archetypal pattern is absolutely magnificent so why does it burn out so many people which it does. It does. So when I talk about the rescuer at the magnificent stage, like shall we say the perfume stage, that's where someone gets the rescuer as a impersonal occupation where you're called to assist and then you leave once your task is done. So the best way to think about it in your own life is... <clears throat> Attention and intention. Put these two words together. That rescuing for attention is going to get you in trouble. So you have to watch your intentions at all times. So think about rescuing as like being a, um, a lifeguard. A lifeguard who sits on the side of a pool or by, by the ocean. And a lifeguard responds when someone's drowning and then that person goes the lifeguard goes out pulls the person to shore and then once that person is recovered the lifeguard goes back to that high chair they sit on so they can see everything it is not the task of the lifeguard rescuer to then follow that person home and Expect accolades and gratitude and um, affection and perhaps a relationship and all kinds of gratitude because they did their job. They did their job. Nor should the lifeguard walk around the pool and decide, I think I want to meet that person. I will push them in the deep end of the pool and then when they can't breathe, I will dive in save them and poof a romance is born <laughs> the shadow side of the rescuer is where a person can get um really 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 blocked and the rescuing can become very dark and it can be loaded with dark intentions private intentions the reason one's rescuing someone is it's not actually, shall we say, positive motives. Um, another form of rescuing that can oftentimes get people in trouble is over-rescuing, is when, when um, you offer, the rescuer offers to do the rescuing before a person even 
you know, a rescue, a really astute rescuer can sense vulnerability in other people and say, no, 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 let me do that for you. Let me do that for you. No, no, it's no problem. Let me do that for you. There's a difference between offering help and rescuing. This is where intention comes in. Uh, offering help is, hey, do you need anything? Let's kind of help you out with that. And no agenda with this. I'm just here. If you need anything, let me know. <clears throat> but the rescuer, <clears throat> a rescuer with um, personal agendas, like I'm, I'm rescuing and I, I really want you to think I'm wonderful. And I really want you to think I'm just like so terrific. That person, that agenda causes a person to jump in where they're not welcome to offer to help, to want the other person to be vulnerable, and to offer to help but not really rescue the person. So it's like the lifeguard again that says, uh, let me teach you to swim, but not really, because I don't want you to learn how to swim, because then you won't need rescuing and you won't need me anymore. So I'll just kind of drag you around the pool in the water, but I'll never teach you how to move your legs in the water, how to move your arms in the water, how to breathe while you're moving in water. I'm not going to teach you how to do that. Rather, what I will do is I'll take you in the water and I'll just pull you by the arms so you can enjoy the water and you'll think you're swimming, but you're not. Because if you learn how to swim, you won't need me. So it kind of looks like support, but it's not. And that type of rescuing happens all the time. It's real subtle. It's very, um, hmm. Mm, can be packaged very nicely. But the, but the fact is the darker intention underneath that rescuing is to keep a person, uh, handicapped psychically handicapped, physically handicapped, emotionally handicapped, because you're rescuing with the intention of not helping them learn the very skill that got them in trouble in the first place, that rendered them in a helpless place in the first place. So <clears throat> the when we look at the rescuer hero figures that we have in movies, for example, and they're always bigger than life and those Marvel characters and those superheroes they're called. And they always come in at the last moment to rescue a group of people or a person and they can, they, but they always come in at the last moment and they rescue and everything, you know, but they, they don't come in to rescue. If you'll, if you'll notice, because they don't sit around thinking, ah, you know, really, I, I'm not sure if I should rescue these people because, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe they'll like me, maybe they won't. That's not the role of the rescue hero. It's to come in, face the obstacle, and then save the people because they face the obstacle. If you have the rescuer archetype in you, it is an archetype that requires refinement. You have to kind of take it through stages in yourself. It is not an archetype that, um, you know, all archetypal patterns, all of our archetypes, we have to grow with them. We have to get to know how this pattern influences the way that we express ourselves in life. The way I, re I remember, for example, Years and years and years ago, when I lived in New Hampshire, which is a long time ago now, um, I came. I came when I came back to the farm. I lived on a farm. I came back to the farm one day, and a friend of mine dropped in on her way back from therapy, and uh, she told me she was getting in touch with her wounded child. I said, "You what?" And she said, "My inner wounded child." <laughs> what are you talking about? <clears throat> this was, I mean, see how far back we're going? And she said, everybody has an inner wounded child. 
And I said, what are you talking about? What are you, I, all right, so that was my initial reaction to this. Can you, can you imagine this? All right, but I didn't, I didn't forget about that, but I just thought, what is she doing? What inner wound? Do you, what are you talking about, right? Not that long afterwards, maybe a couple of years, I can't remember, but it wasn't long afterwards. I had begun to do medical intuitive readings, but they were just baby stuff. They were just my beginning, my just beginning, beginning, beginning. And um, I was lecturing to this group of dentists. And I did not have a whole archive of readings at that point. I, I had just met Norm Shealy. So I had just begun my life in this field. And I was, I was as amazed at these readings, to be honest with you. And so I referred to my own health challenges as a way of saying what the stresses were and da, 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 how emotional stress dealt with this. And that made me feel very vulnerable to do that, right? And I had just come off a very bad case of whooping cough and, um, and something else. And this astute dentist sitting in the, office, in, the, in the audience said, how come someone your age just gets children's illnesses? Huh? <laughs> I'm telling you right there, it was like someone threw, threw a ball, threw ice water in my face. I looked at her, and a part of my interior self, it was like this, the quote, inner child went, la, 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 la. I had no idea, none, that the psyche was so richly, deeply configured that we had all these multiple patterns in us. I had no idea, no idea. And that's how I met my wounded child. That was the day. That was how. That was how. And it, it, in typical me, as soon as I did, I focused 150% on what is that? What is this for? Where's it been? What's it up to? <clears throat> how did it influence me? How has it been influencing me if I didn't even know it was there? And, and once I got my hands on it, I realized, oh my God, it's been calling the shots on so many ways. In that same way, I ask you, and we'll get to the wounded child. I'll do it somewhere down the line. I've been postponing that one. Um, but the rescuer. Because the rescuer is such a strong, vital, incredible archetype, <clears throat> what I would say to you, you, who, all of you who have the rescuer or are involved with it, um, the art of the rescuer is like the lifeguard to know when to jump in the pool and when not to. When to assist someone and when not to. I've been around many situations because you have the rescue archetype. One of the other sides of it is the rescuee. The shadow side is the need to be rescued, the need to be rescued. And that can become an addiction, a lifestyle. And I have been around many conversations in my career where um, I have witnessed the, a rescuer meet a rescuee. And the rescuee says, no, I, I need help with that. I just don't know how to do this. The helplessness starts. The helpless. And the rescuer immediately says, you know, I'll help you with that. No, it's no problem. I watch that dynamic, right? And it takes discernment to realize you actually do need my help versus this, honey, is a lifestyle. And I am not jumping into that black hole because there's no getting out, okay? So there's a difference between knowing this is something I can help with, and then I'll be gone. It is a one-shot deal. I can help you out, and then I'm gone. But the rescuee, rescuing constantly, doing it again, you have to recognize that the role of the rescuer is not to carry someone on your back, 
but to help them in their own way to learn to maneuver, to reboot their survival instincts, not to become their survival instincts. When I see parents jumping in with their kids' lives and doing things like, oh, I'll do that for them, I'll do that, let me do that for them, let me do that. And I think, what are you doing? What are you doing? How can you, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very close to someone whose son had a uh, challenge reading. And so the mother thinking she was doing him a service, protect, protecting him, rescuing him from his challenge that he obviously will have the rest of his life went in and did his homework for him all through high school and then um and then when he got he has been since fired from four different jobs because now that he's on his own he can't read he can't read and she's obviously not there to rescue him from these situations so instead of jumping in and saying, all right, we're going to get to the bottom of this. We have to figure out how to help you to read. Because I will not be there. So we'll deal with this. That's how the rescuer works. That's how. I, I will assist you to do what you are going to have to do in your life. It is your life journey that we have to look at. Not your life journey becoming my life journey. The idea for the rescuer is never think that you are helping someone when you make their problems your problems. That is not rescuing. That's foolishness. That's, that's, secondly, again, rescuing as a way of, um, thinking you're forming a an intimate emotional bond will always backfire. And the reason is, this too is archetypal, by the way. Nature, it's the laws of nature. You know, nature does not support dependency. Look around. Nature supports interdependency or independence but it doesn't really support dependency. We're dependent as children until we are independent as adults. Nature does not support dependency. And so decisions, choices that we make in relationships that foster dependency when someone could make decisions that empower them, inevitably that situation is going to backfire. It's going to backfire because that's your system itself. Think about it. If someone was making decisions that said, I'll teach you to swim, but actually what they did was when they got you in the pool, just dragged you by your hands and moved you around the pool, but never taught you how to swim. Eventually you're going to think something's wrong here. You, you don't want to stay dependent. It's against the flow of life force. It's against this actual deeper need we have to be strong and independent, interdependent. Um, when we, that role of the, the rescuee, when, when, if you have that in you, that constant, um, it, it could be a very manipulative trait. I have to say that one of the things that's difficult to challenge in life is exactly that shadow trait, which is, especially if it's working, but you're not really uh, doing yourself a favor. That our choices in life really do need to be directed toward what empowers me? What, what helps me to not hemorrhage my life force? What do I have to learn? What do I have to know? What do I have to do? Along the way, thank God, we meet people who do step in, 
who do rescue us when we need it, and we rescue them. But rescuing is not a lifestyle. It is an act of empowerment that we, we are blessed with when we need it. We, we can help others when they need it, but it is not and must never become a lifestyle. Okay, everybody, um, that's all for the rescuer, right? It's, it's really not, you know, I could go on forever with these archetypes, but I have this limited um, space of time, but I do so enjoy just chatting about them, even for this brief period of time. So I hope you enjoyed this, and um, I will get around to the wounded child. I mean, that that is one I'm sure many, <sighs> that will take an hour. When I have time to do an hour, I'll do the wounded child. Okay, everyone, thank you.